We have one early oh, take. Boy. You are you are the first one to <laughs> have broken the fourth wall, and uh, here it is. So, well, you're gonna have to tell us a little bit about yourself because you're yeah, not your face. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I I thought I'd be in a waiting line here. You're a popular guy on uh, these. So, anyways, um, happy Friday, everyone. My name is Joseph Lambrecht. Um, my 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 username here is my last name in the Anglo-Saxon form. But uh, Paul, we actually have talked way back in the day, like 2017, 18. So, um, really long time ago. It's fine. Um, but, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. It was a quick uh, randos thing. But, anyways, um, I wanted to hop in because I'm actually in. Um, so I'm in the the Holy Cross seminary um diaconate program and i'm in my final year and so it's basically a three-year program and it's to train guys um who want to better serve in their parish and um possibly go on to become ordained uh as a deacon in the orthodox church and i guess my question to you i don't want i don't want to be rambling on here but my question to you is what what is the purpose of a seminary? Because, <laughs> because you know, you, you Calvinists, you love your seminary education, right? You, you're, you're very astute with, um, you know, all sorts of manners of, uh, of, of learning. And, you know, you think of a, a, a Calvinist pastor, reform, I'll just say reformed pastor, uh, you know, your, your duties primarily, I, w- I would say your duties are primarily pastoral, right? You're visiting the sick, um, uh, and counseling and whatnot. And, you know, you, you do provide teaching, you have a sermon. So there's that pastoral element. There's the, the, I guess, intellectual, um, sermon. And then, you know, your liturgical participation or le- leading, right. You, 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 you correct me if I'm wrong, but as a reformed minister, you are the one that, you know, will pray, before communion, right? Do you, do you allow lay participation for that or, okay. So, but, but still there, I look at those three aspects, right? You have pastoral, um, teaching and liturgical, you know, there's probably a fancy name for all three of those things, but in the Orthodox scheme, right? It's liturgical is probably the, the most important aspect of, um, a seminary education. Then, uh, teaching, uh, doctrine, and then, um, you know, uh, pastoral work. Right. But I get, I thrown a lot out already, but I just want to hear what you, your idea of the seminary is in that regard. Great question. That's a great question. So at the, I made a little short of this now, a, a word to, uh, J W H, I'm going to need to see your camera on before I let you on to make sure, number one, that your camera works, and number two, that you're, you've are you got skin in the game and you're breaking the fourth wall. So just to comment to you, we've got one other person in the, in the queue. There you are. All right. Good. Good. Okay. That's a great question. At the, at the German Breakwater Festival... I made a speech. You can find the video on my channel. Both, uh, both, uh, I've mixed it up a little bit. One of the things I thought about when I was thinking about that speech and I was thinking about the little corner is that over time, there's been a shift of focus in the different traditions with respect to what they saw was sort of as the center of ministry. And so the center of ministry, I think, for the Orthodox has tended to be liturgy. Now, all of the traditions have done all of the main things. They've all done teaching. They have all done pastoral care. They've all done liturgy. They've all done Eucharist. And you could add a few things to that. But Orthodoxy right now, when I listen to the Orthodox, I hear liturgy, liturgy, liturgy. And what you just said sort of confirmed that, that the number one thing in in deacon training for you is you've got to do the liturgy. If all else fails, that's what you need to be able to do. And And if I may interject real quick, sure. The thing about liturgy too, is you can't just open up a book and here you go. 
you know, there's a lot of motion and, you know, oh, does this guy go here or, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. it's not so clear cut. Because your liturgy is embodied. Yes. And yep. your sacred space is three-dimensional. Yeah. And it's intentional. I've been actually thinking, doing a lot of thinking about the the relationship between temple worship in the old, in the first and second temples, tabernacle, yeah. first and second temples, and Orthodox liturgy. Um, but I'll, I'll save that for now. So the focus for you, all of these different traditions are going to prioritize different things, even though seminaries now seminaries in in a protestant world are outgrowths of the university the universities are outgrowths of the monastic movements now it's not incidental and please correct me if i'm wrong it's not incidental that for orthodox clergy clergy that work in local parishes don't usually ascend up the hierarchy it's the monastics that take the place in the hierarchy. Right. However, today that practice is a little uh it's it's a little interesting because you can go become uh you go to seminary and you are a single guy and then you decide, "Hmm, I'm going to go um get my PhD in this language Greek or Russian or whatever." And then they they'll they'll make you a monk for like 4 months and then you're you're elevated to a bishop or you're made an archimandrite and you're put in a holding environment as like, I'm the dean of this seminary and that's a holding zone for you're going to be made a bishop once, you know? So there's, there's a lot of, it's, yeah. When you say that, it's like, there's a way to idealize it, but there's also just admin. There's side. the reality. Yeah. So, so Mark makes an important point. Your university grows out of seminary because the, the question then really is what is a seminary? And and traditionally, of course, the 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 root of the word is semen, which is seed. And seminaries are supposed to be seed beds for the leadership of the church. And so and so the particular, the different traditions and what they prioritize in their seed bed will be indicative of the larger body and its and where it sees its priorities with respect to the clergy. So your question about your question about reformed seminaries has tended to be homiletics, preaching. That has tended to be the number one thing. I remember when Neil uh, Neil Plantinga, Alvin Plantinga's younger brother, who was a professor of mine at seminary, he became seminary president for Calvin Seminary I, uh, for a time, and I remember. When he was talking about his vision for the seminary, he said, I want our seminary to be known as being a place that has developed great preachers. Hmm. I see right there the priority of that tradition. Now, when I went to seminary, you could already in some ways... Now, when I talk about the recessiony of modernity, these things are so massive. It's not like... Yeah, it's yeah. like a tide that recedes because when you the tide may be receiving, but you might have a group of waves that come in and makes makes it looks like you can only see recession on May over yeah. long periods yeah. of time. And so what's been happening in Protestantism as we're, I think, reaching the end of the particular protest that has been going on for 500 years has been a lack of confidence in preaching now. Uh -huh. One of the things that I saw in Tim Keller was a revivification of confidence in preaching. And that was one of the things that really struck me when I looked at Tim Keller. And part of why I, I really saw that in Keller was it, it was clear with Keller that his sermons were doing the converting. Okay. Now, I think in orthodoxy, for many who are coming into orthodoxy, it's the liturgy. When I listen to them, it's the liturgy that's doing the transformation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that the places that are getting the most um, a buzz um, are environments that can foster a beautiful, prayerful, liturgical environment. Yep. 
Yep. And even, even right now, um, some of the best engagement any Orthodox YouTube channel gets right now is actually uh, a, a channel called Orthodox Tradition. And they are Greek old calendarists. So they're not in communion with any of the uh, world orthodoxy because of a human, uh, you know, participation of the World Council of Churches and all this other crazy history. Um, but they get um, th three digit uh, viewers for their their uh, live streams of um, Vespers or something, you know, that is not even a major thing. And people are flocking to it uh, because it is engendering a certain ethos. And, you know, yeah, so it's all about what is going on in the liturgy. So, yes. So, so generally speaking, Protestant seminaries tend to prioritize preaching, the kerugma, right. the proclamation right. of the word, mm -hmm. and then the rest of it is sort of scaffolded up to there. So theological and doctrinal formation, theological education and doctrinal, doctrinal formation have tended to be key. Now, Part of what has been happening in Protestant seminaries is that in the United States, universities were founded by denominations and, oh, right. and yeah, yeah, specific yeah, traditions. And so yeah. the this and so when Mark says universities grew out of seminaries, he's right, especially in the American scene. And it's true in the Christian Reformed Church. They first founded the seminary, and then they founded Calvin College to be a prep school for the seminary, and then they needed to train Christian school teachers, which were often women. Yep. So right. that's okay. the next thing that they had at Calvin College, and everything sort of grew out of there. And you see this on the American scene that first they discussed, first they founded the seminary to do theological education, and and then everything grew out of there. But now, when I went to when I was going to seminary. I would say that the crisis of preaching was already sort of well underway. And so there was a big... Many was that in the 70s or the 80s? 80s. 80s, okay. Many seminarians were losing their confidence in preaching, and they, they were looking for pastoral care. Yeah, okay. And if you look at the, the conversation I just did with Graham Dempsey about modernity... What happens in the main line is the main line sort of hollows out. Liturgy stayed in the main line because one of the interesting things about main line was yes, that. Yes. Oh, my goodness. It's so weird. It's yeah. so weird. Yeah. Low I church. Mean, theologically, socially, yeah, they got yeah. completely yes. liberal. Yes. But, yeah. but yeah. they folk continued to focus on liturgy. Yeah. But the church hollowed out in terms of preaching. And so yeah. the church would tend to devolve into either um, political, political activism or therapy. And yeah, so that uh, yeah, tension okay. was in seminary in the 80s with me. A lot of people were like, all of this theological education, this isn't what's important. What's really important is pastoral care, the yeah. therapeutic. And so that wave was going on in the 80s. And then sort of church planting happened. And what happened in Protestant, especially young, restless, and reform circles, was that um, when that sort of brought preaching to the fore again, because a lot of Protestant per church planting was about a certain kind of preaching, but also big box music. And that became liturgy yeah. for the secret church. So are all of these elements, and, and then many secret churches, because they were Zwinglian, mm. you, you know, Eucharist became yeah. like nothing. Yeah, but then right. there were other churches like Church of the Servant and the Christian Reformed Churches, Anglican churches that began to elevate the Eucharist. So what you see are these various elements of the life of the church sort of taking precedent back and forward in different aspects of the tradition. And then that gets reflected in the seminaries. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Super well, great question. So, so just yeah, one quick follow up then. What do you think lies in future the future for the the current Orthodox model? Because uh, to give you some insight here, you know the the main seminaries in America for Orthodoxy are uh, you know uh, Holy Cross in, in Brookline, Massachusetts. You have Saint Tecons, which is in Pennsylvania. Uh, that's uh, Orthodox Church of America. Um, St. Vladimir Seminary, that's in New York, Orthodox Church of, in, of America. And then you have um, 
uh, uh, Holy Trinity in Jordanville, New York. So the, all these things are in the, the um, upper uh, East Coast, right? Now you have all this swelling of these, you know, uh, 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 Protestant converts, uh, um, atheist converts, you name it, whatever. In, in the Midwest, in, you know, these more rural areas. And, you know, just something that, you know, stri is striking is you have all these clergymen that are, you know, similar to the uh, your denomination. You know, you have this this old guard that is going to be retiring shortly. And how are you going to replace that leadership? And I see it very strange that you're going to demand, you know, um, some guy in rural Iowa. You got to go to Brookline, Massachusetts for five years, spend, you know, $200,000, and then you can be a priest and come back and serve the liturgy. What is going to happen there? You yeah. know? Yeah. So, that, well, that crisis has been happening in Protestant churches already. And that mm. crisis has been in the Christian Reformed Church for the last 20 years. Because okay. prior to 20 years ago or so, if you wanted to be a minister in the Christian Reformed Church, you had to move to Grand Rapids. You had to spend three years in, in Grand Rapids. Wow. And Canadians wow. in particular, they would come in and they couldn't work. And so yeah, that's part true. of what was behind Redeemer. But then you had in the Christian Reformed Church alternate tracks to ministry where you could get a an MDiv, a Master's of Divinity, yeah, yeah. In, another, in another seminary. And then okay. you also had the rise of, just like we've had the rise of non-denominational churches, we've had the rise of non-denominational seminaries. Yeah, right. Okay. And so, and and no, you're you're exactly right. And another interesting tidbit was that in the Christian Reformed Church, in seminary, when I went through, we had near zero preparation in liturgy. Yeah. Oh boy. Near zero <laughs> to the point that when seminarians would get out of seminary, now you had a fair amount of field education and the assumption was you're going to pick up your liturgical stuff yeah. uh, in your field education. But yeah. we had a little class on reformed liturgy, which is pretty simple. And again, it was near zero. But what was also wow. interesting was that in the 1970s, so Church of the Servant now in Grand Rapids is a particularly interesting church because it's sort of become a cathedral church for Grand Rapids. In the 70s, with guys like Nick Waltersdorf and a bunch of Calvin College intellectuals that were into aesthetics, they were exploring liturgy. And one of the transformations that has been happening in the Christian Reformed Church over the last 50 years has been a renaissance in liturgy but that renaissance has been caught in the same in the same battle in the Christian Reformed Church between assimilation to the main line and assimilation to the evangelical. Mm. So sure. Sure. no, your question is great. And 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 like you just pointed out, for things to work in the world, they have to work at all the different layers. Yeah. They have to work for yeah. people's economics. And yep. And so and that distance element. I think is the biggest barrier to entry right now for anyone becoming Orthodox, because, you know, you said previously, you know, you, you, I think you said you recommend not going to a church more than like uh, 15 minutes away or something, which is a brilliant, brilliant point. I drive like an hour and 20 minutes to get to church. Right. And right. that's insane. That is right. totally unsustainable. And, um, you know, I think, I think Orthodoxy is something that can appeal to, you know, like an 80 IQ to 140 IQ, yep, yep. except for try going to try going to a pipe fitter, you know, who's who's uh, questioning about things. And he, uh, you know, you're like, oh, well, you know, you come to this Orthodox church uh, 50 minutes away. And it's like, really? You know, like, yep, I got to do this. But anyways, I, I could talk, go on and on about this. One last thing I'll say, you know, I, I, it's interesting when you think of how this phenomenon is tackled in the old world. Um, you know, I, I've heard it be said that, you know, in, in Greece, if you want to be, there's a distinction between a city priest and a village priest. A, a city priest will go to Thessaloniki, study for three to four years. Village priest will go to Athens for eight months and then you're back in it and yep. you're, you know, you're right in the trenches. 
And I personally think we need to embrace the village priest mindset and just go, you know, especially for the Orthodox where we're, we're liturgy mode. Um, you know, there, there, I, I think there's nothing more important. So anyways, yeah. I, I'd, I'd love to continue this conversation. I yeah, really would yeah. because this, I think that Orthodoxy in America is going to face many of the same challenges that every church faces just by virtue of oh, yeah. culture, economics, yeah. all of this. And, and, and the, the, the dynamics you're describing though, Paul, it's it, 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 what's crazy though, is you have all the, okay. So right now this, I swear this is my last thing. You have all of these, um, you have all this, the, the, so the, the GOA, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese is, is by far the largest Orthodox representation in America. And they have the most, uh, infrastructure. And what's, what's funny enough is that there's a, a, a very large divide between this, this swelling of converts coming in with the, uh, you know, the Greek, uh, hierarchy with the Greek infrastructure, with the Greek academics, and even maybe the Greek population. Um, and so you have this, this uh, disparagement between these two. And it's like the, the Greeks have all the infrastructure and it's, it's disproportionately out east. And, you know, none of their kids are staying in the church. And then you have all these people coming in. And it's just, it's like you, you said in, uh, I think in a past video, you know, it feel, uh, I don't know if this was you. They all mix together. You know, it feels like we're in 1913, you know. Like, yeah, what yeah. Going on, what's going to happen with this cultural clash here? So, yeah. Anyways, well, right, thank, thank you, me. thank you so much, Joseph. Yeah. And yeah. Um, now I'm gonna. I Grim Grim Grizz suggests we're thinking PVK is too soft to host a thing of this nature. Well, maybe <laughs> so, and that's why we try. So, yeah. yeah when you, well, I'm gonna take you out of the room. I'm gonna yeah. bring somebody else, but then drop out so more slots can be. Yeah. And I'll, yeah. I'll okay. try to be. Sounds I'll good. try to be economical. Right. Take care, Paul. Thanks. All right.